the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you, happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages, I've puck the Comic Weekly straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine, thank you. How are you? And I'm fine, too, thank you. Well, everybody's just fine, aren't they? Yes, they are. Now, what's uppermost in your mind today? Oh, Peter Pan. And, and you know why? Why? Well, because last week Peter taught John and Wendy and Michael how to fly, and today is the day that they're to go back to Never Never Land, and I managed to see them fly through the air with the greatest of ease. So could we hurry up right away quick now and read the funnies? Puck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, under Bringing Up Father, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Toot me a toot and tweet me tweedle. Give us music for Bailey the Beetle. Today, Beetle and his friend Killer Diller, who loves the girls, are in town. Killer sees a beautiful girl approach. Killer waits till she's right beside him and then gives her the old wolf whistle. The girl gives Killer the back of her head and goes on down the street. Beetle says, Hey, why don't you give up, Killer? You'll never get a date in this town. It'd be better off if you just got your mind off girls. Well, all right. I'll try. Then come on. Let's play a game of pool. Third picture, top row. They're in a pool hall. But every time a girl passes, Killer runs to the window and goes, Hey, look, look. A dame, a dame. Beetle says, Oh, this isn't working. We'll have to go somewhere without windows. Beetle tries many ways to get Killer where he can't see women, but no luck. Finally, first picture, bottom row, they find themselves in front of the servicemen's club. Beetle exclaims, Hey, how about a nice swim at the club? Yeah, that's a good idea. And a moment later, they're inside the club and see... The place filled with beautiful bathing suits, filled with beautiful girls. And they see a sign which reads, Servicemen's Club, Bathing Beauty Contest. And Killer yells, Wow, Beetle, you got the best ideas. Beetle says disgustedly, Oh, fooey, I give up. And gives Killer a push. And into the pool he tumbles. And a second later, Killer comes sailing out the door. And a voice yells, no swimming today. And last picture, Beetle and Killer soaking wet sit on the sidewalk. Beetle says, Ah, oh, you're hopeless. Just then, a beautiful girl comes down the street. And Killer says, oh, I wouldn't say that. I still have lots of hope. <laughs> Hopeless. Yes, if he couldn't get a girl with his whistle when it was in good condition, I don't see how he can get one with that water so cool. I don't either, unless some girl feels sorry for him because he's soaked. You know, that could happen. <laughs> yes, it could. Well, I wish him luck. Now let's turn over the page, go past little iodine and Prince Val on page three, turn over that page, and here on page five of the first section is Peter Pan. Pirates, crocodiles, Peter Pie Pan. Whisk up music for Never Never Land. Peter Pan, the little man from Never Never Land, has come to the darling household searching for his shadow, which he had lost in the nursery, which, of course, is the room of Michael, Wendy, and John. Peter found his shadow, and Wendy sewed it back on. And Peter taught the children how to fly. And now they're on their way out of the window with Peter's little friend, Tinkerbell. On the way to Never Never Land. As they go through the window, Peter shouts, Come on, everybody, here we go! As they sail by overhead, Nana, the children's faithful dog, looks up in amazement at seeing the children flying over her. And she says, Which means, Go back to bed at once, you naughty children. But the children fly on. 
Last picture, top row, Tinkerbell flies by herself, still sulking jealously over Peter's attention to Wendy. And then, first picture, bottom row, up, up, up they go, past Big Ben, over the Tower of London, above the Dome of St. Paul, and then high over the Thames and up into the clouds. And then Peter points and says, There it is, Wendy. Second star to the right, then straight on till morning. And last picture on they go toward the enchanting island of Never Neverland. Ooh, there they go to Never Neverland. Yes, over the clouds and over the bridge and over the tower and away they go on their adventure to Never Neverland. And next week will we see Pirate Hook? I have a hunch we might, so be sure to be there. Oh, I will, I will. Now let's turn over the page... And look, on page six, under the little king, there's Uncle Remus. Oh, and little Br'er Rabbit, and I just love him. So do I. And so here we go with Uncle Remus and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity-hoppity, hoppity, make, make it a habit, habit to, to give us music for old Br'er Rabbit. Rabbit. Uncle Remus says... Uh, Br'er Rabbit figures he's found a new way of uh, playing Br'er Cupid. Yes, Br'er Rabbit, who is very much in love with Molly Cottontail, is planning a new campaign to court her. He's writing a note which reads... The air of the straight, the word is true. Sure is shooting. I loves you. Then Br'er Rabbit wraps the note around an arrow, then gets ready to go off to serenade Molly Cottontail, saying... And right in the middle of my serenade, I shoots the arrow up to Molly. <laughs> In the middle of the moonlight, Burr Rabbit, pushing a wheelbarrow, carrying a harp he has made especially to serenade Molly with, approaches Molly's house singing, Oh, Cupid leads me here to you and says you tell me what to do. And he sets the harp on the ground and then standing before it strikes a note, last picture top row, and begins to sing. Yes, but do these words I sing. And pretty soon you'll want the ring. It First picture, bottom row, where Rabbit's voice wafts in through Molly's window. She takes a flower out of a dish nearby and says romantically, When he finishes, I'll throw him this flower. Oh, your pretty eyes. I knew your love was cut in my size. And so I sing these words to thee. Don't turn your shoulder, come to, to me. And then Br'er Rabbit, finished with his song, aims the arrow with a poem wrapped around it at Molly's window. Of course, you think that Br'er Cupid shot this arrow. And then let's fly with the arrow. Straight for the window it flies. <laughs> Molly stares furiously at her broken window. Well, I'll fix him. And she throws the flower pot. And iron, pans, shoes, rolling pins at Br'er Rabbit, who dashes down the road, last picture. And she shouts after him, Can't you ever do anything sweet without making it sour? And Uncle Remus says, You can put too much heart in affairs of the heart. <laughs> oh, poor Br'er Rabbit. Yeah. After all of that romantic lovemaking, he didn't look to see if Molly's window was all. And instead <laughs> shot the arrow right into the window, shattering glass all over her face. <laughs> poor Br'er Rabbit, he tried so hard. <laughs> yes, and poor Molly was all ready to be sweet to him and drop him a flower until that glass hit her in the face. <laughs> well, next time, maybe Br'er Rabbit will catch her when she's on the porch. I hope so. Yes. Well, now look across the page. There's Roy Rogers. Oh, yes, Roy Rogers, and he's in trouble. Yes, because last week Roy was helping his friend Doleful Hawkins by capturing two tough characters who tried to get the drop on him. And then their boss, a man named Fancy Pharaoh, rode up and got the drop on Roy. And now there are three men against Roy and Dolfo, and those men all have guns. What's going to happen? Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, king of the cowboys. Ayip yip yo now here we go with Roy and Trigger. Ayip yip by yo Fancy Pharaoh, leader of the crooks, faces Roy and Doleful with drawn guns. Well, looks like I arrived just in time, Doleful Hawkins. You were forcing my men at gunpoint to fix your ore wagon. Hey, boss, look out! But Fancy turns too late. Doleful's nephew, Tim, has doused him with a pail of water. And Roy has the drop on Pharaoh. Doleful laughs. Hey, for once, my ornery nephew did the right thing. Hey, 
nice work, Tim. Roy says to the thugs, All right, famoose, gents. This fighting between your freight lines has got to stop or somebody's going to get hurt. The men mount up. And last picture top row, right off. Fancy Pharaoh says, And yeah, Doleful's pal is right. Somebody's going to get hurt. I'll whip you and Creaky head for town. Drat that kid for dousing these new duds. Later in Pine City, first picture bottom row, Roy and the boy, Tim and Doleful, rein in before the Bratton Freight Company for whom Doleful has a contract hauling ore. Doleful says, Like I said, Roy, Fancy Farrell's outfit is setting hornswoggled on my boss, Hank Bratton, out of the ore hauling contract we got with the Tomahawk Mine. Roy replies, Well, let's talk to your boss, Doleful, see if we can't work something out. So Roy and Doleful go up the steps to the office. The boy, Tim, says, Hey, I'm going out back and play Indian. Well, keep out of mischief now, Tim. I'm sick of your monkey shines. Roy and Dolfo walk into the office and then stop in astonishment where a man lies stretched out on the floor. Hey, great Scott, is this your boss? Dolfo kneels beside the man. It was, Roy. He's dead. And last picture behind the building, Creaky and Bullwhip, Pharaoh's two men are coming out the rear entrance. Bullwhip says, come on, let's go, Creaky. Rogers and Hawkins will be coming this way any second. Just then, Tim runs around the corner and, seeing the thugs, throws rocks at him. He head for the hills. Redskins coming. And Creaky exclaims, Say, stop that, you pesky little brat. Oh, those two men, they beat Roy into town, and, and they're the ones who killed Dolfo's boss, I know. I'm sure you're right. And, and just wait till Roy finds out that Tim saw those two crooks coming out of the back door, then Roy will go after them, I'll bet you, and fix them good. Well, next week we'll find out if he does. Now it's time to go to the very last page of the first section. So over the page we go, and here's Flash Gordon. Oh, yes, and Flash is on the planet Venus, which was ruled by that cruel King Stang. Yes, and Flash was a prisoner of King Stang. But after many troubles and dangerous adventures... Flash finally overcame the king. And now the king is Flash's prisoner. I wonder what'll happen now. Well, let's read and find out. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Riga riga doon doon saskamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Anxious to make peace on Venus, Flash offers a full pardon to the deposed tyrant Stan. But with the pardon goes a warning. Venus must be free. Not only for its inhabitants, but also for visitors from Earth. Stang eagerly promises to cooperate. But already, a plot is hatching in his crafty mind. Vicky, the former queen, is also pardoned and reunited with Stang, her husband. As she is brought to Stang, their first meaningful glance is a secret, unspoken pact to regain their power at any cost. Dale, warned by her woman's intuition, begs Flash not to give them their freedom. As Flash stands undecided for a moment, Last picture, top row, his friend, the treeman, Crelia, says, Don't worry about Stang Flash. This corps of loyal treemen I am organizing can handle any emergency. Flash decides to play safe and answers, Crelia, you better assign a couple of men to keep an eye on Stang and Vicky, just in case. <laughs> Guards are put over Stang and Vicky. Stang enters his quarters. When the guard follows... Stang boldly offers the startled treeman a fabulous bride. These gems are yours, if you will but deliver a message to my friends. Greedily, the guard reaches for the bag of gems, snatches up the message, which contains instructions for an attack on Flash and Krillier. The message is delivered to the necessary people. It gives directions to launch an attack on Flash and Quillier during the meeting of the planetary delegates, which is already beginning the task of choosing a new leader in the great hall of the palace. Flash, last picture, steps to the rostrum to nominate Quillier, unaware of the mortal peril to himself and his candidate. He doesn't know that an attack is about to be made on him. Oh, I just can't <laughs> wait to see if it really will take place. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to. Next week we'll find out, though, for sure if it does. Now it's time for Dagwood and Blondie. Oh, and I know just where to find them. On the first page of the second section. Well, you just spread out the first page of the second section, and I'll read Dagwood and Blondie in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. <laughs> Now 
here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. I'm a food, I'm a fum, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. Blondie looks out the window. Oh, oh my goodness. How terrible. It's starting to rain. Dagwood says... What's so terrible about a little rain? It means the children will have to play indoors. They nearly tear the house apart. The last picture top row, the door opens, and in come all the kids in the neighborhood. Here they come. See what I mean? First picture, second row, Dagwood says, Don't worry, I'll take care of them. They merely need some supervised amusement, and I don't mind to guide them. Good luck. Dagwood goes into the next room where the children are playing. Come, children, pull up, pull up chairs, and we'll play some nice games. Uh, we don't want to play games. That's corny. And the kids all dash at Dagwood, sweep him up, and carry him on their shoulders. Last picture, second row. <laughs> we want to play cops and robbers. <laughs> I got him, I got him. First picture, third row, they turn a chair upside down. No, no, stop it, stop it. Children, be nice. Stretch Dagwood out on it, almost breaking his back. Children, careful, my back, my neck, my feet. In time to the chair. Stop, stop, my ankle. Hey, he's a bad guy, and he's tied to the railroad track. Yeah, and here comes the train. Chugga, 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 doot, doot. Chugga, 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 doot, doot. Ten minutes later, the kids have taken Dagwood upstairs. Hey, no, no, stop, don't, let me go. And they toss him down the stairway. Hey! Now he's going over Niagara Falls. Splash, 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 splash. Last picture, third row, Blondie staggers down the hall and sees a vase drop from the mantelpiece in the living room. Oh, mercy, the house is shaking as though there were an earthquake. <laughs> First picture, bottom row, the kids have tied a rope around Dagwood's feet and are hauling him up to the chandelier. No, 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 please stop, please stop, let me go, let me go. Hey, what a posse, and we caught him. And Dagwood's daughter yells, Okay, everybody, pull. Hey, no, no, let me go, will you? At that moment, Blondie looks out the window and shouts, Hooray, the rain has stopped. Yay, we can play outdoors. And out of the house, the kids go. Come on, come on, out of sight, we go, yippee. Last picture. Blondie goes into the living room and sees Dagwood hanging upside down from the chandelier, and she bends down and says to him, Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah I see what you mean. <laughs> oh, poor Dagwood. Yes, poor Dagwood. What those children oh, did to him. He looks pretty worn out. Yes, I think I'd rather have a truck run over me than have to deal with all of those children. Say that. Well, I would. Why? Well, a truck is only one. But look at all those kids. Oh, you're just teasing. I know you love children. <laughs> yes, of course I'm just teasing. I <laughs> love children. Well, now let's turn over the page. And look, on page three of the second section, Dick's Adventures. Oh, and I'm anxious to read this because you remember that Dick is in the early days of America when the English and the Americans were at war. And he was in the city of New Orleans, and he and his friend, Major Villiers, I've been captured by the pirate, Jean Lafitte. And the pirates are taking Dick and his friend deep into the swamp. I wonder what will happen to them. Well, let's read now and find out. Say the magic words with me. rickety pack a zack a zit That's some music for adventurous Dick. Noiselessly, a boat glides through the mysterious Louisiana Bayou country, bearing two angry captives of the notorious pirate and smuggler, Jean Lafitte. It's the year 1814, and Dick and a companion have discovered a plot linking Lafitte with the British fleet that is at this moment waiting to attack New Orleans and the Americans. Smiling, Lafitte orders his two captives untied. Last picture, top row, the boat comes to a stop, and Dick and the Major are untied. They stare at huge alligators that are swimming around the boat. One of the pirates nods toward the alligators and grins. I know you will not be so foolish as to attempt to escape. First picture, second row. Major Villers demands, where are you taking us? But he receives only a charming smile and no answer from the pirate's chief. And then they are on their way again. <laughs> For hours, they continue along the strange, twisting bayous from which startled birds rise with harsh cries. Last picture, third row, they emerge into an open body of water. 
Barataria Bay, fretted with hidden coves and inlets. And now Lafitte's boatmen head swiftly for shore. First picture bottom road, Dick and the Major find themselves in a bustling town of pirates and smugglers. Here, Jean Lafitte rules in splendor like an all-powerful king. But last picture, prowling offshore, is a fleet of British men of war. Lafitte turns to Dick and the Major and says, Tonight I am giving a banquet in honor of the officers who are hoping to persuade me to betray New Orleans. Yet perhaps I shall change my mind and betray them instead. You will attend as my guests, my prisoners, and as spies. Oh, I'm so glad that Dick didn't try to escape through the swamp. Those alligators might have eaten them up. Yes, they're mighty dangerous. And just think, those pirates have a whole city of their own hidden away in the swamp. I'm glad that Lafitte is going to be kind to Dick and let him come to the banquet. I mean, I, I hope that that means he isn't going to be mean to him anymore. Well, we'll find out more about that next week. Now, look below Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes, Rusty Riley. And Rusty is running away from Milestone Farm and his friend Tex to get away from his mean uncle. And he's joined a carnival where his friend Stovepipe is. And Rusty discovered two crooks were making plans to do something bad to the owner of the carnival. Yes, but when Rusty overheard the men, it was in the dark, so he doesn't know what these crooks look like. So then Rusty happened to meet the men in the daytime, and they asked him if he wanted a job, and so Rusty said, sure. And now he's going to work for these two crooks, and he doesn't know it, and that might get him into terrible trouble. Well, let's read now and find out if he does. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Rusty, who has been talking to Stovepipe, points out the man named Specs, who has hired Rusty to work for him. Stovepipe says, Well, well, so he calls himself the great necro, eh? Most interesting. Well, why do you say that, Mr. Stovepipe? You know him? Well, I cannot claim personal acquaintance with him, Dusty, and I could be wrong. But I believe that last season in the Deep South, he followed a small Connie with which I had a temporary connection. But then... He was just the slick card manipulator. Stovepipe goes on last picture top row. If my memory serves me correctly, he was known as Specs. But look here, lad, you've got to live somewhere. I'm about to seek lodgings in the village. Suppose we share diggings, huh? Oh, jeepers, I'd like to, Mr. Stovepipe. Hey, just let me get my suitcase from that shack where I slept last night. A few minutes later, Rusty is getting his suitcase out of the shack where he slept the night before and where he had heard the two mysterious crooks plotting in the darkness below. Hey, golly, I'm glad Mr. Stovepipe asked me to stay with him. His shack is sure no bargain. Hey, I wonder what flip secure he's about. Then Rusty sees something on the floor and picks it up. Jeepers, it's a piece of jewelry. A man's cufflink. <laughs> Third picture, bottom row. Carrying his suitcase, Rusty trots between the tents that are being set up. Specs, the man who hired him, calls. Hey, where are you going, kid? Not running out on your job, I hope. Oh, no, no, sir, Mr. Necro. I'm just going into town to find a place to live. Last picture, Specs hands Rusty a dollar bill. Oh, well, if you're going into town, you can do something for me. Here, take this buck and buy me a pair of cufflinks at the five and dime. I lost one of mine. Huh? I, 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 uh, yes, yes, sir. Oh, sure. Oh, and now maybe Rusty will know that the cufflink he found in the shack was lost by that man named Spex, and then Rusty will know that Spex is one of the crooks. Yes, especially since Rusty knows that Spex has lied about himself being a big, famous magician. One stovepipe says he was just a man who used to do puny little card tricks. Yes. Oh, I wonder what Rusty will do next. Well, we'll have to wait until next week to find that out. Now, let's turn over the page and see what we shall see. Oh, look. Here's my favorite, favorite, Donald Duckle. Yes. And we'll read your favorite, favorite right now. Here we go with Donald Duckle. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squiddly chicka chat. Let's have music to better quack, quack. <laughs> Donald has decided to try to make money in a new business. So today, he and his nephew Dewey set up a suitcase full of mirrors on a stand beside the sidewalk and put up a sign which reads, Sale, hand mirrors, three dollars. 
And then Donald waits for people to come by and make their purchases. Two hours go by, and Donald hasn't made a sale. Finally, his nephew Dewey tells him, Hey, look, you can't sell playing mirrors. Hey, uh, Uncle Donald, why don't you do this? We could do some 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 Excellent, son. Pure genius. Donald takes out his paintbrush. And first picture, bottom row, Dewey looks at a sign and says, Gee, Uncle Donald, that ought to work. And we see the sign, which now reads, Hand mirrors, designed exclusively for left-handed people. Only three dollars. And Donald waits for left-handed people to come along and buy his mirrors. An hour later, Donald hasn't sold a mirror. He turns to Dewey. Some idea. Still no sales. People are too smart to buy it. Right? Dewey cheerfully smiles. I overlooked an angle, Uncle Donald. This is what we do. First, we take the... You see? Terrific. We'll try it. Donald takes out his paintbrush. And a moment later, sets up another sign which reads... Special discount to right-handed people, only two dollars. And by the time you get to the last picture, we hear Donald say, Sold out. And two ladies, each with a mirror in her hand, are going down the sidewalk. And one says, He doesn't know it, but I'm left-handed. And the other one answers, Shh, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you bet he's the one. He figured out the way to help Donald sell all of his mirrors. And that's Donald Buckle. He's so funny. You bet he is. Well, now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right. Tonic-Wiggly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs>